Okay, welcome everybody. We're here and hope you are. Um, we have an interesting topic. Usually we talk about um, uh, building and construction uh, failures or how to maintain something, but we decided to to do a switch and talk about something fun for a change instead of falling down buildings and things like that. So I was interested in buildings that are on cliffs, on high mountains. So that's the topic today, uh, cl cliff dwelling construction. And this is a little different. It's really not talking about houses that are on hills, like expensive houses that are high up on a hill with the nice ocean view and mountain view and all that. It's mainly talking about buildings that are kind of built on cliffs and mainly older buildings. So that's the topic for today. This is uh, Ask the Building Expert webinar series. And the webinar is presented by Construction Management Inspection. This is Lance Luke and Martin Pea, we're the hosts. And if you have any questions, just feel free to uh, type it on our Zoom platform or on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. And if we don't catch it, we'll be able to respond to you um, shortly thereafter. But we try to monitor these different social media accounts. So take a look at this picture here. You see these buildings that are built like right on the mountain. And this is uh, in <clears throat> Bhutan uh, in Asia. And so the elevation is like about between 8,000 to 10,000 feet high and which is basically above sea level. And that's like super high because if you ever been to um, Lake Tahoe, there's heavenly, the ski area, and that's about 10,000, a little over 10,000 feet high. So it's pretty high up on the mountain. So the question is like, why do people actually build on cliffs? And the answer could be, well, because there's no room to build on flat land, it's already taken up, or we're in an area where it's all mountain and there's hardly any flat area. So we have to build basically on the mountain or on the cliffs. So for instance, in uh, Madeira, Funchal, Madeira is an island that's owned by Portugal. And there's a lot of, lot of hills. There's not too much flat land. It might be like a flat area on the beach, but a lot of uh, hills and mountains. So therefore you have to build on the hill or mountain. So that's why people build because there's no other room or there's no other uh, flat area. The other reason why is in the old days, people needed <clears throat> protection from either the elements or from um, <clears throat> invaders that are going to be invading uh, their their home. So they decided to build in a remote location so it's hard for other people to attack them. So that's another reason for uh, defensive purposes. Um, if you've ever been to uh, San Francisco, there's a lot of hills. There's a nice uh, quaint city called Sausalito, and it's not hardly any flat area. So it's all houses and buildings are on the mountain and on the cliffside. So there's basically two types of cl cliff dwellings. Okay? One type is in, in the old, let's go way back prehistoric days where they have, you know, the cave men, cave women, they live in caves. And so that's one type where it's just some kind of cave that's built into the mountain. And 
structures like that. And then the other type of dwelling is you build something on top of the mountain or partly into the cliff or into the mountain and then the building sticks out. So there's like in the natural format, there's a caves or you take a part of a cave and you start digging more out and all of a sudden it becomes a house. And then the other um, type would be start building you know, part of using part of the cliff or part of the mountain and then extending it uh, further out as far as you can on the overhang um, so that it doesn't fall down and crash to the ground. So basically those are the two types. So who builds on cliffs? Well, uh, I guess people that have money and it's not that easy to build on a cliff because you're not dealing with a flat area. So how are you gonna haul your materials to the, the job site if you're building on an overhang? Um, if you have, you gotta be sure that the foundation is sturdy. It's hard rock, it's not like soft soil because when you start building, you're gonna have your building uh, you know, fall, fall over into the, big ravine down below or if you have water you know it's gonna roll down into the sea or the ocean okay so the people who are who build on cliffs got to be really specialized in in building on uh, high elevations and where there's a lot of rock and where the land is not even flat and that's just a really specialized skill to do that and people got to know what they're doing. Like when I visited San Francisco, they're um, doing renovation of these apartments or uh, homes that are built on cliffs. And so they have to set up like a intricate scaffolding system to even, you know, get to where they need to work on the side of the building or even for uh, painting. They, they do that because you, you can't, reach the building from the ground. So let's talk about various construction materials used. Well, if it's a cave, whatever type of rock it's used, then that's the material. It's built in, it's, it's natural. And a lot of materials are limestone. And you can carve into the limestone or hard clay and then they, um, the builders decided um, they wanted to build add-ons. So you can't, you can't add on to what you already, like if it's a cave, you can't add on to the cave, right? Unless you bring in outside materials. So that's where they decided to get um, these clay bricks. And adobe is like hard mud soil, compacted soil. So in the old days, that's what they did. They used uh, dirt, adobe soil, made made uh, clay, and uh, form all these bricks. And that's why you see a lot of old buildings that are made from these bricks that are hundreds of years old and they're still standing. And so that's the kind of material, whatever material was available at that time. So there could be <clears throat> some areas where you need a beam and you can't construct a beam out of bricks per se. Um, so then you, they started cutting down trees and using uh, logs uh, for beams. So it could be a combination of you already have your limestone there, you cut into it, you add some bricks, you add some wood and, and there you go. So that's the old style and believe it or not, uh, some of these old buildings are still standing today and they were built thousands of years ago. So the idea was to use as much uh, nature or natural materials as you can. So cliff dwelling locations around the world, um, you know, there's a lot of places that have houses, like in, in the United States, they have in Arizona and New Mexico, uh, if you look at the Arizona one, it looks like uh, they built into this big rock. 
and you got bigger pieces of, of bricks that were used. And then in New Mexico, uh, looks like they just carved right into the side of the mountain and made uh, little caves or some of these caves aren't just a single cave. They're like uh, plenty rooms in it. It could have 50 rooms or 100 rooms. And if you keep carving into the mountain, and there's some that are actually more than one story. There's multiple stories. So it's interesting. In Colorado, you have like the um, Indians that actually built their fortresses uh, right on the cliffs. And it's pretty interesting to see. And then you go to China, and then you have these temples or other structures that are basically built um, right against the mountain. So in some cases, they're using part of the mountain as part of the foundation for the building. And the China picture is interesting because somehow they, they carved the mountain and they made the flat area there. So I don't know how long it took them to build that. But as you know, it's, it takes a while because it's not like you're building on flat land. And let me see here. And then we'll go to uh, Europe. And you see all these houses or buildings, um, like in France, Spain, Italy. It's all mountain areas. And you have all these buildings. And it's like surprising how many buildings are all bunched together on, on the side of a mountain. Okay, um, this picture of France, you have a bunch of buildings on the side of the mountain. And then in uh, Spain, you have the buildings that are like right on top of the mountain, but there's nowhere else to build because you're, you're building your, your wall like right on the edge of the cliff, as you can see. So it's pretty interesting how it's done. Now, in certain parts like um, France, uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, Italy, it's common to have like this red colored, orange colored roofs. So when you see a whole bunch of roofs, that's all buildings, you know, right next to each other. But then you might say, well, what happens if there's an earthquake and the buildings are built like right on the edge of the cliff? Well, it, if it was bad, if it's a bad earthquake, the buildings would be like all falling down into the big ravine down below. Let's see what other locations. Uh, Mali, you have uh, buildings that are built uh, against the mountain too. And it, it's mainly sort of like the uh, Colorado ones where the buildings are pretty much square, squarish design. Yemen, you have a whole bunch of buildings, uh, big buildings. In fact, you can't even see the mountain at all because they use pretty much all the space. So wherever they could build, you know, that's where a building uh, went up. And then here's a good uh, shot of Italy. Um, you could see like there's hardly any space that's not a building, right? So you see uh, the greenery. Okay, so there's some areas where there's a bunch of trees, but otherwise it's mostly buildings. And um, I'm not sure why there's maybe it it it's such a um, rocky area that they couldn't build where the trees are and that's why the trees are still there but it's pretty jam-packed as you can see um and of course they have they have nice views but can you imagine um where is the where's the the road to to get in like in uh madera when i was there you have these houses on a cliff and you you from the main road, this small little lane, 
you go down, walk down, maybe 150 steps to get to your house. And, and that's if you live on the down slope. If you live on an upslope, you're walking 150 steps from the main road up. And the, the main road is like these little lanes. Where you, it's basically one lane that is wide enough for two cars, basically. But um, none of the cars are really that big. And a lot of people use their bicycles. Here's another image. Um, you can see it's really a cliff because you see all the uh, rock and the vegetation. And these houses in Spain are like super old. The roof looks like it's in bad condition. But um, yeah, this is a good, a good shot because you could see it's like built right, right on the mountain. So you kind of wonder um, it. If you need to do repairs, like how are you gonna do the repair work? Like, especially like how are you gonna paint the side of the building that's like right on the cliff or uh fix the roof? So it's really complicated in getting and building for the first place, and then after that, when you need to maintain it, well, how are you gonna how are you gonna really do that? So it's it's interesting. So you may ask, well, fine and good. You got all these buildings that are built on the cliffs and all that, but what kind of building codes apply? Well, let me tell you that all, all these buildings, like if you look at this picture of the buildings, these buildings are super old. They're like built in the 1800s or early 1900s. And this is not um, uh, a picture of anywhere in the United States. This is probably probably in Europe somewhere. So the United States has a different building code than other parts of the world. And other parts of the world, the building code is, is way more lax. Okay? For instance, in China, the building code is way more relaxed in the United States building code. In other parts of the country, uh, parts of the world like Turkey and Haiti, there, there is a building code, but a lot of times the building code is not followed. And the building code that is there is not as strict. And, and the problem with um, the building code not being followed is you build, these buildings and it looks good from the outside and everything, but whenever there's a, a natural disaster, like an earthquake, let's say, uh, take, take for instance in Haiti, you have an earthquake, all these buildings start collapsing and, and crumbling. And I think there was one um, earthquake in Turkey or somewhere and the building started crumbling. And then I read these reports when they sent in engineers to investigate what happened. Uh, they determined that the majority of the buildings didn't even follow the building code. They had a bad mixture of concrete. There was hardly any reinforcement. And um, there was some uh, payoffs with from the contractors, developers to the building officials and they turned a blind eye and they didn't inspect and that's why you have all these buildings that are falling apart so there's a uh, some areas around the world there's a lot of corruption and when you have that then you have a big safety issue now if there's no earthquake the building is standing but once there is then it's a problem and then when they didn't follow the building code to begin with. You basically cannot even repair the building. You have to demolish it and start from scratch. So you cannot repair a building that wasn't properly built because then you're at, let's say it's a second story or third story that collapsed and you still have your first floor there. You have a foundation in your first floor that is 
uh, badly constructed, you can't start building on top of that. You're going to have the same situation, even if you have good construction and you follow the, the building code to a T. So that's that's the problem. And in other countries where the building code's so relaxed and it's already a problem problem already. Um, if you look at uh, like uh, Chinatown, for instance, like we're located in Honolulu, Hawaii, but if you go to Chinatown in San Francisco or Chinatown in Hawaii or New York, these buildings are super old. And it's it's interesting because it's like Chinatown is like a separate area in itself. And the, the local building inspectors don't really want to go in that area to enforce anything. They kind of like leave it alone unless there's a complaint. And that's another problem because you got buildings that aren't to code or over time, the building code changes and you have this building that was built in 1905 where almost everything doesn't conform to today's code but it's grandfathered in, meaning that uh, you don't have to bring the building up to code because at the time that the building was built in 1905, it complied with the sparse, uh, lax building code at that time, right? Only if there's repair or renovation being done and in certain circumstances, then you need to follow the current code. Now, there's another code called the existing building code, which allows a more lax approach to the code if the building was built like, so if the building was built in 1905 and you need to do repair, it's, it's kind of hard to require the building owner to follow today's code, right? The, the 20, uh, 21 building code, let's say, because they don't have to spend a million dollars fixing this building. So they came up with uh, a gray area, like, okay, let's not be so strict, but you still got to follow some things. We understand that your building's super old and there's no way you can fix everything to conform with today's code. So we'll, we'll, we'll cut you some slack and we'll let you do certain things, but uh, certain things we're not going to turn the blind eye. For instance, where it comes to electrical, right? You have to basically bring it up to current code. We can't leave it the way it is because it's dangerous. Because uh, over 100 years ago, uh, they didn't have the technology that they have today to require upgraded uh, circuit breakers, amperages, and all that. In fact, those old buildings don't even have circuit breakers. They either have direct wiring or they have these old uh, fuses. And sometimes when I go inspect these old buildings, I see stuff I, I, I've never seen before. I'm like, what is this, right? Oh, it's a, it's a old uh, electrical fuse. And I'm trying to look for the date and... Um, I mean, I see the date 1920 or something like, okay, well, I know this can't be right. Uh, since then, they probably upgraded and they made more, they made circuit breakers instead of fuse boxes and with fuses. So that's just an example of the the change in the, the building code. Every three years, the codes get changed and the codes do not get changed to make it less of a requirement the codes get changed to make things stricter so that's probably uh, you know a, a general statement there could be a few areas here and there where it's uh, maybe a little more relaxed but for the most part it it's not so relaxed because what is the building code it's a minimum standards for health and safety of the occupants, health and safety. So when you're talking about health and safety, you, you cannot digress and go uh, and make it lesser of a requirement because as time goes on, we're aware of more technology and more things, you know, why? Like, why do buildings fail? What, what What's the cause of fires that are starting? 
And then when you get all these studies, you go, oh, most, most fires start in the kitchen. Okay, so we have to make codes so that it's safer for people in, in the kitchen. Okay, so uh, another example would be, oh, there's a lot of fires that come up in single family houses. Well, how do, what do we do to prevent that? Okay, so the solution is we would require the installation of fire sprinklers. So some parts of the mainland, it's mandatory that if you're building a brand new house, you have to install a fire sprinkler system. Now in Hawaii, that's not required, but because it adds, adds to the cost, right? But when you think about it, isn't that safer to have a house with fire sprinklers than as compared to a house that doesn't have any fire sprinklers? But there's always the pros and cons, right? It's like, oh, uh, that's going to add another twelve to fifteen thousand dollars to the cost of building a house. No, we don't want to do that because when you keep adding more and more stuff, it's just going to be too expensive, and the people can't afford to buy. So that's what the developers are thinking, right? Even the homeowners are thinking, well, I already like maxed out my construction loan. In building this house, I, I can't even afford an additional twenty thousand dollars. So, uh, yeah, let's not put in the fire sprinkler system. And the owner may ask the contractor architect, "Well, is this required by the code?" And they say, "No, the code doesn't require." They go, "Okay, then don't put it in." You know, what's the chances of there's going to be a fire that's going to burn my house down? And anyway, down the street there's a fire hydrant, so. Um, I'm, I'm not worried too much. So, you know, that's the, the mindset and the frame of mind. So there's pros and cons to, to all that. So this is a fairly fast uh, webinar as far as the content. Uh, so the conclusion that I have is when you're building on a hillside or on a mountain or on a cliff, Hey, be very careful. You have to do your uh, due diligence. When you're building on a, a mountain or anything that's not level, you have to do multiple uh, soil testing to test the soil. Because you don't want your house sliding on the hill. Historically, in Hawaii, there's, there's houses that were built on uh, what we call adobe soil. The soil is not stable. It's not solid. So what happens is that type of soil, when it gets wet, it expands. And when it dries, it contracts. So can you imagine you have a house that's built on that kind of soil and you have rain, you have sun. All of a sudden, the soil just keeps moving. And when the soil moves, guess what? Your house is on top, sitting on top of the soil, right? So your house is going to start moving too, cracking, um, settling. And the, if the house settles, the whole house settles in one direction downward, it's maybe not too bad. But when the house has differential settlement, like let's say the front of the house settles a half an inch, the back left side of the house settles a quarter inch, and then the back right side of the house settles one inch. What's going to happen with your house, right? So you're going to have doors that it's going to be hard to close. You're going to have cabinet doors, cabinet drawers that are stuck, windows that are like you can't close it. The frame's all, all off and your cracks in the concrete. So there's all these different things that could happen because the soil is bad and it transfers, you have bad soil, you have movement, your house is gonna be moving too because it's sitting on, on the soil, right? So if you built on solid rock and the rock's not gonna move, then your house is not gonna move, right? So just be aware of that. Now, even if you're building on flat land, you should still have your soil tested to make sure you know what kind of soil it is. And the contractor should recommend that too. Because I've seen many houses where I'm going in after the fact and there's cracking in the foundation 
and the owner says the contractor never recommended uh, getting any kind of soil tests. And the contractor said, well, we gave them the option, but the owner said, we didn't want to pay the thousands of dollars that it took to get it the soil tested. So therefore, uh, we're not going to go that, that route. So what you miss, well, we've given, I lost count already, numerous webinars on building and construction and even a couple on real estate. So uh, we have a website you can go to and you can watch these webinars on demand. If you have any questions pertaining to any webinars we've given, just email us uh, and then we'll be happy to answer them for you. And then what's coming up, we have um, some webinars coming up. We're going to be talking about uh, kind of diverting a little from our normal construction and building webinars. We're going to be talking about uh, the rail, the Honolulu rail. We're going to be talking about uh, Red Hill, uh, what's happening over there. And then we have uh, why hire a construction manager. And that's important. Even if you're building your own house or doing renovation, you might be. Um, if you're spending a lot of money and let's say over $50,000, you might want to hire a construction manager or a consultant to help you instead of just leaving it up to the contractor. Um, and I could tell you uh, stories of people, owners who spent money and they didn't hire a consultant and there was problems at the end that involved uh, so bad in litigation. And the money that they spent to pay the consultant was less than the money they spent to hire an attorney to go fight the contractor. So um, that's just something more of a tidbit information to help you. So you might ask, well, you've been talking about your website. Well, what? how do we get to your website? It's askbuildingexpert.now.site. And... We're always updating our website. We have a team of people uh, that help us add our webinar videos on the site. We have publications, books that we're writing. And if you go to different sections, you can download the books for free. And this is all free. We're not asking you to pay anything. So take advantage now because who knows, in the future, we might have to charge. So uh, visit our website and then uh, see how it can help you. We have so many topics and you're probably not going to be interested in all of them, but the ones that you are interested in, you know, we uh, ask that you uh, watch the video and then get back to us if there's any questions. So we're, we're here to help. And right now I'm going to open it up for uh, Q&A. So you got questions, I got answers. If you need to get a hold of me, my phone number is 808-422-2132. Email Lance Luke at hawaiibuildingexpert.com. Now, um, I respond to all inquiries, questions, comments, anything. It may take me a while, but I eventually get to it. Or if you're watching this webinar on social media, you know, please feel free to post your questions or comments there, and then we'll we'll be able to 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 get to it. So I'm gonna bring our co-host on and see if he has any questions on anybody that is on our Zoom platform or on Facebook or LinkedIn or anything else. So Martin, let's uh, bring you back on and see if there's any questions. Yes, Lance. So we've had a, a few questions that have come in. So let me share them with you. Uh, the first one we have here is what are some of the unique challenges of building on a cliff and how are they addressed? Okay, so uh, let me stop the screen share here. Okay, so in answer to the question, the challenges are For the contractor and the well, for the architect designer, how are you going to design this house so that it doesn't slide off the cliff? Okay, so 
there's certain things with respect to the foundation and the main structure that has to be taken into consideration. So the other thing is for the contractor or builder who's going to build, there's, there's extra work, there's extra labor in trucking the materials to the job site and extra work trying to build safety um, precautions into the building. For instance, if you're building right on a cliff, you know, you got to be sure that the workers don't fall off. So there's additional safety precautions in not only the workers, but for uh, equipment and bringing in uh, whatever building materials that are needed, constructing a roof, constructing um, the drywall and all that. Um, it just all these components are taken into consideration when you're building. It's a little different. That's why people who are building these houses on Malibu and with the nice views and all that. Why is why is the house more expensive? Well, because the transportation, the fact that you got to get from point A to point B, and it's not like uh, carrying bags of groceries. You're talking about huge, huge pieces of lumber, steel, um, thousands of pounds of concrete and uh, roofing material. So all these got to be taken into consideration. So that's why the cost is is a lot as as opposed to if that that house was uh, on a flat piece of property. Okay? Now, if you go and take a, a cliff and you start digging into the mountain, you know, that takes uh, a lot of effort too. That takes like heavy machinery. And how are you going to get your excavator up there on the mountain? So there's a lot of things that got to be taken into consideration. When I checked out houses um, that were up like Pismo Beach and um, even uh, Malibu and uh, San Luis Obispo, they they actually have tower cranes. You know, the same tower cranes that are used to build high rises around the city, like Kaka'ako or San Francisco, LA, Miami, Atlanta. Yeah, they got a tower crane at a job site to help build a single family house. So it, it gets pretty interesting. And if you talk to construction workers and ask them, uh, they'll they'll tell you stories about how it's not that easy to build the house because you have to take extra safety precautions. So, um, yeah, that was an interesting question. Yes, it was. Thanks, Lance. Um, the next one is a follow-up one is, how do the building codes for cliff dwelling construction differ from those for traditional construction? Well, it's basically the same building codes, and I'm talking about United States, like the International Building Code, IBC, and IRC, International Residential Code. It's basically the same, except that there's additional engineering and things to be aware of because of the location. So you, you take a design of a regular house, okay? It's going to be designed and built on a flat piece of property. Okay, that same house you can build on a mountain, but there's certain things you got to be aware of. There's additional things that you got to do. And that's why the structure engineer and the uh, soils engineer have to work together and, and design the foundation accordingly. So um, there's extra design costs involved and extra building costs involved to reinforce the foundation and all that. But um, the, the codes are the same, but the difference is additional work in the design just because of the uh, lo location. And um, it, that's probably uh, to be expected because, um, you know, building on, on a mountain is is a lot harder, right? So, so there you go. Thank you, Len. Um, makes sense there. Uh, the next question that's come in is, uh, 
Can the materials used in cliff dwelling construction be adapted for use in other types of building projects? Well, the answer is no and yes. The, the answer is no if you're talking about the old um, buildings that were built with adobe clay, bricks, limestone, and all that. Um, those are, are not necessarily approved uh, by the current code. Okay, so there's um, product and building materials that go through rigorous testing and all that to be able to be approved to be used for modern day or today's construction. Okay, so in other words, uh, you can't use adobe, clay, or uh, limestone and say, I'm going to build my house out of that. The, the, the building, local building department would kick it back and say, um, no, that's not acceptable for structural uh, use. But if you want that look, okay, you can design your house with uh, steel or wood. And that's your um, foundation, that's your walls. And then you could have a, a thin limestone cladding or red brick that looks like adobe and put that on as a veneer. So basically, after the house is built, if you look at uh, the house, it looks like it, it's all limestone or all red brick or adobe soil, but it's really not. It's like a, a veneer siding that's over your main house structure okay so there, there's a difference there you cannot use the the same materials because for these houses that were built way back when uh it's not approved by today's code right so you can kind of make it look like that but not really um for instance um in in the old days in hawaii Right and other parts of uh, Polynesia, you had these what you call grass grass huts. Right, it wasn't really grass; it was like made out of uh, palm fronds and thatched together with rope and stuff. Um, is that allowed by today's cold? No, because it can easily blow down when there's a hurricane. Okay, so. The things you can do to reinforce it and then have it as the covering, um, but e even that is is uh, not acceptable. Let's say you do a, a a brand new roof and you make it out of asphalt shingle, but you want the look to look like an old Hawaiian house. So you you get all these palm fronds and you uh, staple it onto your existing roof. Is that acceptable? Well, the look's going to be like an old building, but the fire code doesn't allow you to use palm fronds for your roofing. So, you know, that's that's a difference. Sometimes you have to get approval. Say, this is a historic building. Uh, we know that it doesn't meet the code, but uh, we have to restore it to look the same. Okay. Um, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. So let me bring up something. Uh, now we're, uh, we're on the subject. That Lahaina fire that everybody is aware of, the buildings in the commercial area, the restaurants and all these uh, shops and all that, the zoning code for commercial allows you to build right on your property line. So you basically have these buildings right next to each other, you know, e touching or inches away. And what material in, in the 20s, uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, what material was used to construct these buildings, right? Wood. So they're all old style wood frame buildings that were copied from plantation style houses. Plantation style houses were built to house the plantation workers that came to Hawaii and worked in the pineapple and sugarcane fields. And those houses are single wall construction, post and pier, all wood. And you have a totung roof or corrugated iron roof. So in Lahaina, a lot of these structures were made out of that type of material. 
So when you have one building burns and it's right next to another one, the next building, then pretty soon your whole block is on fire. Okay, so that's something to, to be aware of. The, and it's good. The, the current codes are, are strict, but remember the codes are minimum standards only. They're not maximum standards. So if some structure doesn't follow the building code and you think, remember the building code is minimum standard, then it's already a problem. How many builders today are building to the maximum requirement of the building code? Well, what is the maximum requirement? We don't know because uh, the building code is a minimum requirement, but the architect or engineer can say, well, instead of using a, a two by four here, we want you to use a two by six, it's stronger, right? Or uh, your uh, six by eight piece, but let's, let's make it thicker or uh, your ply board instead of a half inch, uh, we want to use uh, uh, three quarter inch and make it stronger. The code only requires half inch maybe, but so you can exceed the building code. You cannot degrade it or go below that. So I hope I didn't digress too much, but, um, and hopefully I, I answered the question. So you got any others? Um, yes, Lance. We have one one last one here that, as far as the uh, cliff dwelling. It says, what are some of the most impressive examples of cliff dwelling construction around the world, I guess, that you've uh, experienced and what makes them unique? Well, I haven't really traveled as much as you, Martin. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for, from, from what I saw, well, United States, and it's all like, more modern houses that I've inspected. Um, let me see. Uh, mostly California, all on, on, on the hill with like superb views. It's like crazy. California and Oregon, because there's a lot of uh, uh, mountains and, you know, view of the ocean and things like that. Multi-million dollar view. And the houses are all, all on cliffs. But what happens when when there's heavy rain and there's landslides and your foundation starts um, eroding away and then your house starts like slowly sliding down the hill, right? So that's not, not a really good thing. So there's talk about uh, global warming, climate change, and now we have like a lot more uh, rain and the rains are a lot heavier, almost like, um, uh, storm or hurricane type rain and that's the more water than than ever before so when you have even if the the soil is solid you have constant rain and it's eroding away the soil then pretty soon your foundation is uh, getting eroded away it's sort of like if you've seen uh, pictures or videos of houses that are on the beach right and the ocean comes and washes the sand away and pretty soon the house is falling into the ocean. It's the same kind of concept, except these houses are on a hill. They're not even near the ocean, but it's erosion. So beachfront property, it gets eroded from the ocean. Mountain property or cliff type property, the soil gets eroded from the wind and rain and uh, storm. So um, it's not getting any better. And you have these multi million dollar houses that now they, they probably need multi million dollar fix. Some of them you probably can't even fix it because if the, the natural part of the mountain eroded away and your house is right there because of the view, um, if you have uh, a big lot, you could probably rebuild your house further in. But there's some uh, situations I've seen where the house, the multi-million dollar houses were uh, evaluated and it was determined it was a total loss. Even if the front of the house was still intact, the back of the house is like hanging over a cliff. So the insurance company says, oh, no, we're not, uh, you know, you can't save the house. So it, it's it's pretty scary what's, what's going on. And the saying is always, you can't fool 
around with Mother Nature. So no matter what you do, the ocean or the uh, wind or the rain, you, we can't we can't control any of that at all. So we just have to take uh, better precautions and be aware of what what may happen in the future and kind of you know do what we can for prevention. Now uh, back to the the Lahaina fire. Uh, all these houses are going to need to be rebuilt with precautions for um, in the event there's a, a wildfire again. Now, do we want one? No. And hopefully we never have one again. So, but that's just a protection. So in the event of uh, a wildfire, these new houses going up, they shouldn't be uh, uh, burning or catching on fire because they're using uh, different kind of materials to help, you know, deflect the fire. Like that was the one house that that had uh, stucco walls and a metal roof that didn't get uh, touched by the fire. Okay. The reason why is the metal roof, the fire's not burning the roof where other houses around there had uh, roofing material that was flammable. And they also had uh, vegetation. They had trees and plants growing too close to the house. So you need to have uh, a, a, a space there between your house and any kind of uh, tree or bush that could catch up fire. So, uh, you know, the people rebuilding, they have to be uh, aware of that. And I'm making a website now that the uh, Lahaina residents can go to as a resource for reference. And I'm available as a consultant uh, for them to reach out uh, for free. Uh, we offered to help anybody that needed our help in the uh, questions regarding design, what kind of building materials, uh, how to work with a contractor, how to find a contractor, and, and those kind of things. So I know I kind of diverted, digressed a little, but I think it's uh, all good. Uh, any other comments or questions from anybody? No, Lance, I think that's all we've gotten today. And uh, good, good job. Nice, uh, nice divergence from uh, you know the regular building and construction it, I always thought my place was kind of like a cliff type but you know it's just on the slope that goes into a stream that's all <laughs> <laughs> well see there's a difference because in Hawaii we have all these mountains and valleys right and we have to because we have a shortage of land we're not getting any more land with the exception of if the volcano erupts and the lava ends up going in the ocean, they will have more land, but we can't build on that. And, and plus that no private owner would own that. That would belong to the state and it's gonna take a while uh, if the state decides to allow building on that. But all these mountains and um, areas where you have these neighborhoods such as like uh, Aliomanu, uh, Palolo, Hawaii Kai, uh, all these areas where St. Louis Heights, they're just, they're, the houses are built on the mountain, right? But they're not really built on a cliff per se, except for some that have uh, uh, maybe rim lots where the house is like right. I mean, even in Aina Haina, when I look up, I see these houses on stilts and all that. So some of them are built on the cliff, or, and and some, I, I most of them aren't. But um, yeah, so your house, your house isn't on a cliff. Your house is built basically on a mountain, but it's the mountain is low. You're you're actually uh, on the bottom of a mountain because if you look, you can see the mountain, the Koalaos, right? Right. Now, when you look at the Koalaos, can you build any? Any house on, on that? No, man, that's like a cliff. That's why when they built H3, man, that was a huge undertaking because you're 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 spanning, you're building a, a freeway basically where there was nothing there before, right? And then you have to connect it to uh you're you're actually building 
the freeway on the side of the mountain. And then how are you going to get through the mountain? That's why they have to tunnel through to get to the other side. So, I mean, that's why it costs so much. And now we're dealing with other costs such as the rail and maybe uh, a law stadium. I don't know, but we already gave a webinar on a law stadium. I might have to do another one later, but uh, yeah. We're, so uh, for, for you guys listening in, um, we're planning to do a webinar that's not on our schedule on uh, fire safety because there's uh, too many fires everywhere, you know, mostly in Hawaii uh, that we're aware of. I know there's fires all over the United States, but um, I just felt that I need to to get the information out for people. And it, it is ironic because the, the last uh, fire uh, in a building, when I went uh, the day after to look at it, it was an apartment building and there's a fire extinguisher right outside the building that wasn't used. The fire happened so fast that nobody even went to use the fire extinguisher. And anyway, I think that if they did, it wouldn't have mattered because the fire was so big already. And I, I got photos. So if you uh, want to attend that, uh, stay tuned and you can see the, uh, the photos of uh, some of the photos I have where that, that whole building is in flames, basically. So anyway, um, that wraps it up. And uh, thank you guys for attending. Uh, feel free to reach out, post your comments or questions to the various uh, social media sites out there. And then uh, stay tuned uh, for the next webinar. Hope you can join us and, uh, you know, reach out. We... We also uh, want to ask that if you have any topics that you want us to cover, just let us know and then we'll uh, take a look and uh, consider that. Because some of the topics of our webinars were actually from people who said, hey, can you talk about this or that? Uh, and it may, be, it may be of interest to others, uh, not, not only to you. So uh, right now we... Uh, we're preparing our webinar schedule for next year, 2024, because it's right around the corner. And uh, we're going to have that up on our website shortly so you can take a look at the topics and uh, see if you're interested in any one, two, two or more. How do we know it's the end of the year? When I walk into a store and uh, uh, I see like a picture of a turkey, I see Halloween candy for sale, and then I see a Christmas tree. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why can't we concentrate on one holiday at a time? And then these stores barrage us with, like, I I'm confused. Like, uh, do I buy Halloween candy and, and then buy a turkey and then now shop for Christmas gifts? Or well, whatever. I don't know. It's getting, it's getting kind of ridiculous, right? So it's crazy. Even, like, right after New Year's, Right after New Year's is over, you go to the store and you see like uh, Valentine's Day candy. Like what is going on here? And then, you know, but like the Halloween candy, now it was like weeks ago, but I know some people that go oh, Halloween candy. So they, they buy the bags of candy early, like a month before Halloween and they're snacking on it. So by the time two weeks come before Halloween, they don't have any more Halloween candy. They gotta go buy more. So that's their excuse, right? I'm like, why do you have two bags of Snickers? Oh, well, yeah, I gotta go buy more. Cause like when they have breaks, I'm eating it and then I eat all my candy and I don't have any, any candy for the kids anymore. But anyway, enough of that. Um, if I don't see you guys uh, before Halloween, have a happy Halloween. Oh, Martin, do we have any other uh, webinars coming up? Um, for as the building? Yeah, you know, any building ones? Uh, as the building, let me see. Well, you get all your, uh, oh, the ones you mentioned, the rail, Red Hill. And oh, okay. So if you guys are tuning in, we also give a series of, it's called 
uh, ask the marketing experts where we talk about uh, business marketing, small business owners, entrepreneurs. We talk about uh, uh, how do you social media, websites, all this stuff. And now we're really into AI, artificial intelligence. And um, you can see what we're doing, how we're using AI to uh, promote our, our different businesses. And it, it's, it's really helped a lot. And uh, by the way, all my Ask the Building content is not AI written. It's MI written, my intelligence. And it's Martin intelligence. So, um, and it's real world information, right? It's coming from us. We're not like telling you stuff from like a textbook or um, stuff we learned in university engineering class, right? We're telling you stuff in the field if you watch our webinars, you see that I'm giving you uh, experiences and sharing the information with you. So it's it's to me it's a a, a little better. That's why um, uh, I know I have a few minutes. But when I was a visiting professor uh, in in Georgia in the uh, Georgia Southern University, and so the the uh, normal professor says I'm going to introduce you to Professor. Uh, Luke is going to talk to you about uh, engineering and construction management. And it was third and fourth year engineering students. And the first thing I said is, thank you. Now, you know, all your textbooks and all that. Put it in your desk. You don't need that. I'm not going to be talking about it. And they're like, oh, what are you going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about real world experiences in the trenches. I've been an engineer for over 40 years. I'm going to tell you stories that you never heard before and you're never going to hear in a textbook. And so I, I, I gave the class and at the end of the class, they're all excited. They came up to thank me. And uh, it was in, even the professor that was there said, wow, you were going to have you come again. And I'm like, I'm not coming to Georgia anytime soon, but I'll be happy when I do come. I'll be happy to, to you know, give a lecture to your engineering students. So it also helped because I took um, I took a bunch of uh, Hawaiian type keychains that had like dolphins and surfboard and all that, and I had these contests. I asked questions, and whoever answered it, you know, they got a keychain, so they they got a kick out of that. So anyway. Um, going to wrap it up and uh, thank you very much for attending. Stay tuned for our next webinar. Go to our website. We've got a lot of good stuff there. We're constantly updating it. So on behalf of Martin and I, Ask the Building Expert uh, webinar series, thank you and see you again. Aloha.